Next talk we have is uh, Neil Brown from uh, SUSE. He's a kernel engineer at SUSE. And this talk is uh, SysFS classes for uh, virtual block devices, which is slightly shorter than what I had in the program. <laughs> the original title I probably should have shortened. So uh, Neil, please. Thank you. Yeah, so when I came to make the, slide, make the slides, I realized I had to shorten the title, because it's more kind of a mini abstract or a long title that I was gave him. So I picked out the important bits, and the important bits are SysFS and virtual block devices, because so those are the two concepts I'm interested in, want to talk about, um, hope you might be interested in how they, how they work together. By virtual block devices, I particularly mean RAID sorts of things, MD and DM, um, which I might call MDM from time to time, because hopefully the distinction is blurring and will blur more. Um, so... SysFS and adding new functionality is, is something I've noticed a few times is, is a bit of a problem. SysFS isn't something that uh, was kind of designed perfectly in the beginning and has a design document we can all fo always follow when we're adding things to it. SysFS kind of evolves. It originally was really focused on power management and how to, you know, I guess, to know what device you had to power on before powering on the next device and so forth. But it's kind of grown since that in different ways. And I, I pick up sort of reading the lists and stuff, that different people have quite different ideas about what should be in SysFS, what it's for, what its purpose is. Um, just recently, it was a bit of a kerfuffle because in SysFS there are these symbolic links between um, like a DM device and the com device of a component of it. It's called their slaves and links, links going one way are called slaves and links going the other way, I can't remember what they're called. But... Um, it was suggested that this was wrong and SysFS should never been used this way and it's horrible. Which may be true, but uh, the people who originally implemented how are they to know? Um, do you know? And so I figure maybe if I, I want to do something new, it's good to try and find a forum to, to present the ideas and get people to complain and tell me how wrong I am first. And exactly what forum to use isn't clear. If I po post some design document on the LKML, it'll probably get ignored. People like code... They don't like design documents. Um, if I posted code, it would probably end up going upstream before anyone complained about it. So I thought I'd try a conference, and maybe there'll be someone here who could say, oh, I don't like that for some reason, and maybe it'll be a good reason. That'd be good. But so I should ask, who, who thinks they have some understanding about SysFS and, and what goes on inside it and how it works? <laughs> a, half, a, couple, a few half hands. Who's tried to understand and kind of failed? And it's just... The same hand to going up, <laughs> and a few more. Um, yeah, it's it's got some really good stuff in it. But trying to say, well, this is this is what it's meant to work. This is the rule for how it works is really hard. I mean, the only rule you hear so often is um, one file, one value, one file, one value. And I'm not sure that actually makes a lot of sense when you have like array values and stuff like that. So the only rule we have isn't much good. So. Basically, I'm here, I want, want you to tell me if the idea is dumb, reflect any way that you, you can. Um, is this sort of thing you'd like to see more of in SysFS, what I'm talking about? And what I'm talking about is, is using SysFS to, do, to expose more of the structure of things like DM and MD. Um, for those of you who don't know, DM and MD are the two kind of competing sort of RAID thingy implementations in Linux. They combine multiple devices into, well, actually multiple devices, one device or more devices. Um, the MD focuses more on traditional RAIDs, as RAID 0 and RAID 1 and RAID 4 and RAID 5 and RAID 6 and RAID 10, which is a bit special. Um, what MD stands for is not clear. It's either multiple devices or meta devices or, or something. DM focuses more on logical volume management. So there's less of the redundancy management. It's more of, well, chopping up a device in lots of little bits and reassembling them into whatever you want it to. But it's the same basic concept of taking some devices and producing some virtual devices out of them. And so they have a lot, of, lot in common, but they're really two com completely separate code streams developed by different people with different agendas who don't talk to each other. Not because we don't like each other particularly. I've met a number of the key developers, and they're nice guys, but they're busy doing their thing, and I'm busy doing my thing, and there's just not a lot of cause for overlap. Um, but as, as that first point says, we have just 
recently beginning to see a little bit of unification. Um, I've sort of wanted there to be more unification for a while, but I never had the time or the motivation. What, what's really brought it along was there's a, a DM implementation of RAID 5. It's not in mainline, but it's in SLES. I'm pretty sure it's in Red Hat. I'm certain it's in Red Hat. Um, and it's maybe being used, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think there have been bug reports against it, so it's probably being used. Um, and having a separate RAID 5 implementation is, well, having two of them in the kernel is not really a good idea for maintainability. It's actually fairly complex. You know, RAID 0, there's two different RAID 0 implementations, but RAID 0 is really trivial. Um, it's no big deal. RAID 5 is, is a different kettle of fish, though. Um, so that sort of pushed me to sort of do a bit of work towards unification, and something else pushed one of the DM guys to do a bit of work, and so we have been talking to each other, which is, which is really quite awesome. I'm not sure creating what we've currently created, which is, I think, in the, the current merge window, well, the recent merge window merged a driver that uses MD's RAID code to present a DM target, which maybe isn't terribly useful, but the important thing is a step towards talking to each other. But anyway, um, even if we, we merge bits of MD and DM at that level, there's still a point that there's some core problems in both DM and MD that need to be solved, you know, for both of them. It'd not be nice to solve them for both of them at once, rather than I, I fix it for MD and find that it's really good, doesn't quite work properly for DM. And, and making horrible designs neat is, is a rewarding part of kernel development, you know, it's, it, right, right, fixing bugs is kind of good, but it gets boring after a while. Actually, doing something new and making it look neat and elegant um, getting rid of the rubbish and creating new stuff is, is something I like doing. I hope a lot of kernel developers do. Um, and so the particular focus here is device creation. How do you create a new MD or DM device? What, what does that look like? I mean, if you think with, with a USB drive, you plug it in and then magic percolates all the way up the stack. It's an external physical event that causes it to happen. Um, but you don't have any external physical event like that for... for MDM sort of devices. Um, and the way device, device creation works at the moment is actually quite ugly. It, it doesn't play very well with UDEV. It, we've made it work. Um, every so often the UDEV maintainer says, you know, this should be fixed to me. And I think, well, yes, it probably should, but it kind of works at the moment. Um, so the point, what's wrong with it? Need to think about a, an array array. Let's stick with RAID. An array is, is there are two kind of distinct objects. There's the, the mapping, the array, the description that says these few devices have to be connected together with this chunk size and, and this sort of layout and whatever. And that sort of describes the array. And then as a separate thing, there's a block device, a block device which you can, which appears in slash dev, which you can open, which you can mount, which accepts a standard sort of interface. So the block device kind of defines the interface to this thing, and the, the array defines the structure of this thing. Um, that might seem a bit abstract, hopefully it'll get a bit clearer as, as we move on. Um, and the problem is that both MD and DM create these things at exactly the same time. They use completely different mechanisms, but essentially they're created at the same time. What that means when you create it, you've got a block device that doesn't work. You try and read it to look at the petition table, I.O. error. You try and do anything to it, I.O. error. So UDEV sort of finds this device, tries to initialize it as it does when it sees all new block devices. Maybe this is a device I should mount somewhere. Maybe I should, maybe it's encrypted and I need to do some encrypto thing on it. Um, it can't do that because there's no block device. It can't, so it can't respond to the add event when it appears. It's got to wait sort of for another separate change event that comes on and says, oh, you know, that block device I gave you a while ago, well, there's now data there. And that's, that's an ugliness. And it's, I mean, that's a fairly simple view of the ugliness, more deep. You look further down, it's, there are, in the code, there are kind of ugly aspects of it as well. Um, so they should be separate, and they should be a clear ordering. You know, the, the array should be created first and then set up, and then the block device in it. And so this is where we, we connect to SysFS, because SysFS is a lot about, well, some, one aspect of SysFS is a lot about device discovery order. As I mentioned, there's originally, as I understand it, developed to help power management. And so there's a devices tree, and in order to turn off, you can't turn off one device in the tree until you've turned off any, everything further down the tree, because there's kind of a dependency. 
unfortunately, life is actually more complex than a hierarchical tree, isn't it always? And sometimes you have to do uh, multiple things that are dependent. Well, a lot of things can depend on multiple things for power and addressing. But anyway, the basic idea of the devices part of slash sys of slash sysfs is that um, a higher thing is needed to access a lower down thing. So things are discovered from the top down. So in kind of a typical SCSI ID SATA sort of device, you have a host bus adapter which has got a bus. And then you, in that you find some targets. In the target you find a logical unit. Inside the logical unit you find a block device. On that block device you find some partitions. In the partition you find a file system. In the file system you find a file. And a file. Um, anyway, so it's, it's a nice, it's superficially a nice clean hierarchical thing. As I said, there are sometimes exceptions that don't work. So how, how can I follow this pattern to make virtual block devices work? Um, and it seems kind of obvious once you presented that way that there should be a thing, a device in slash devices that represents the array and then a child of that, a subdirectory, a subfile, something of that, the device that represents the block device. And then it again might have partitions, of course. Um, but that's not at all what we've got. What, where a DM or an MD device appears is simply in, um, I got that wrong, sorry, it's slash sys devices virtual block. There's this subdirectory in sys devices called virtual, um, which just gets all the rubbish. Everything that doesn't belong somewhere else gets thrown in there because it's probably a virtual device, but it doesn't tell you anything about the structure, sort of who controls it, who owns it. Um, it doesn't differentiate between MD devices and DM devices and loop devices and and other sorts of virtual devices. So it's, yeah, it's a bit ugly. Um, okay, what else? So currently the main thing you see is just the block device. You don't kind of see much of the array at all, which is not a bit. I mean, if, if, if SysFS really is the way of the future, and some people might think it isn't, but I think the reality is that if we want uniformity in the kernel, we want to make as many things use SysFS as uniformly as we can. So DM currently doesn't expose anything else in SysFS at all. All you see in SysFS is the block device. If you want to configure it, there's this major ARCOTL for doing configuration. And it kind of works, but it's legacy. It's not the way of the future. MD does have some stuff in SysFS, but it's in exactly the wrong place. Right? Um, as I said before, the array should be above the block device. You, you define the array, and then out of the array you make a block device. But the MD stuff in SysFS is inside the block device. So you have a device directory called SD, uh, H called MD0 or MD1. Inside that, there's a directory called MD. And inside that, there's your chunk size and your layout and your RAID level and all the other stuff. So it's exactly the wrong place, which is my fault. I put it there, but I blame Q. If you look inside a, a SCSI drive, any block device, there's a directory called Q, which refers to the request queue, but that actually technically belongs up at the SCSI layer. It's not, I mean, the, when you instantiate a block, uh, SCSI drive, it actually creates a queue so it can send a request to the device to see if it's actually a block device. So the queue exists before the block device, but it appears in SysFS afterwards. This is one of the reasons I have trouble understanding SysFS. It breaks its own rules, and because they're never being written down. But anyway, so the current state of MD and SysFS is, is ugly. It's in the wrong place, and even though I put it there, I, I don't like it being there. It should be, there should be a, a way to put it above. And I mean, the whole way that, I mean, the way MD devices are created at the moment is also ugly. You actually do a MookNod, MookNod in slash dev to create the block device, and you open it. And that action of opening the block device causes it to exist, which is really backwards, too. Uh, at the time, it probably seemed like a good idea 12 years ago or whatever when this stuff was first written by somebody, somebody else, but it doesn't feel like a good idea anymore. So how would I fix this? What would I do to make this better? Um, and is this a good use of SysFS? Does this actually fit your model of how SysFS might work? Or more accurately, does it deeply offend your model of how SysFS might work? So people are more likely to talk about how they are offend, offended than, than how they are pleased. So you know, does this, can you imagine this offending you or someone else? Um, and so the idea is to create two new, two new device types. One's a class device and one's a bus device, which itself is a bit awkward because um, 
some people tell me that this distinction is going away, they're all going to be called subsystems. Um, we'll get to why there's a distinction between them soon. But anyway, a class device and a, sub, uh, a bus device. Um, vol group is obviously short for volume group. It represents the concept of volume group. Now, LVM has a concept of volume group. That's, that's a good concept. It's a concept that doesn't actually exist in the kernel at the moment. So adding it may be not necessary. It's kind of one thing I'm a bit certain of. But the basic concept is that it, it's a set of volumes that are described by one chunk of metadata. Right, so if you have a bunch of arrays and they all have a bunch of drives, they all have some metadata stored on them, and it describes several different arrays that make use of those devices, then that's one volume group. If you have, you know, this set of devices that have metadata describing stuff here, and this set of devices that have metadata describing stuff there, then they're kind of two separate volume groups. Um, a lot of a lot of vendor metadata. So when you get these firmware RAID cards or fake RAID cards, whatever you choose to call them. Um, they tend to, well, those that allow multiple arrays um, will allow, will have multiple arrays on a particular set of drives, all the drives attached to their, their own controller with one set of metadata for all of those. So the kind of a idea of a volume group rather than just individual volumes does make sense to some degree. Um, and I think it helps. And the way you create a volume group is just to echo a name out as to a magic attribute in slash sys slash class slash vol group slash new or something, which does have a little bit of a precedent. So this is one thing when you're doing stuff in sysfs, you want to say, well, how did somebody else do this? Is there a precedent? And, and there's a, um, a module called pkcdvd, which is packet access to CDs and DVDs, which allows you to do, it makes it look like they've got 512 byte sectors when really they've got something like 4, 4K byte sectors and you can do reads and writes and it coalesces them and it does the right stuff. I don't know much about it except that you can create them by echoing out to a Sisyphus attribute. But when you, you follow examples in Sisyphus code, you've got to ask yourself, is this a good example to follow that other people would say, yes, that's a good idea? Or is this actually a horrible example that everyone who's ever used it thinks, oh, this is so hard to use? Because I've never actually used packet CDVD myself. I don't know how it is to use. Hello, question? I was just going to say there's another example, which is the bonding device has the same degree of bonding. Right, so this is a network bonding device? Yeah. That so you basically write to a thing and write that you want one to a file and copy it to another file. The issue was the higher place was chosen in the hierarchy was cut it off or placed. So that directory has, ends up containing Right. So it's good to have this, inter and this is a reasonable interface, but where you put it in the hierarchy is just as important. Okay. So just um, to repeat, the, the question was simply an observation that the bonding networking driver has a very similar sort of concept, and so there is more precedent, which I like to know. That's always good. Um, but there's a very good point that I've sort of thought of too is, is namespace control inside the various directories. I mean, it's kind of best, either a directory has a, a bunch of ad hoc names for like attributes of, of a device or something, or it has an ordered list of names, like uh, names of all the devices. Right? But if you try and mix those two, then you find you can't create a device named add, because add is a special file for adding new devices, as this is a thing that came up or was mentioned about. Um, bonding devices that you have both a list and some ad hoc names in the one directory, and uh, that's certainly a a bad thing. I think I've probably done that in the MD subdirectory too. So, um, but it's good to actually. I mean, it's, it's worth kind of writing all these things down somewhere, somewhere, to try and avoid making the same mistakes again. Um, so, vol groups are a volume group. is a, a fairly simple concept. Basically, it we can collect volumes into it. It gives sort of an identity to a group of volumes, which is more than just um, aesthetic. It does, does have a little bit of meaning, which hopefully I'll get to in the next slide. The other type of device, which is a bus device, is I call volume. And a volume includes both physical volumes for people who understand LVM and logical volumes and RAID arrays, everything that can conceivably contain a bl block of data. Um, a contiguous set of data is a volume, and volumes group together into vol groups. Now, 
the reason why volumes have to be bus devices is, brief pause, who knows the difference between class devices and bus devices? Who knows that there are such things? <laughs> a few hands. Um, it, it took me a while to figure out the difference. It's kind of, once you see it, it becomes, oh, of course, um, but until you see it. Well, the difference that I saw is that bus devices, you can bind a driver to each different device. So you can have a different driver for each device on the bus, I guess. Class devices, there's no concept of distinct drivers. There's just uh, a class device has a set of methods somewhere deep in the kernel that does stuff. But you, with a bus device, you can specifically bind a separate driver to each device on the bus. Um, so a SCSI target turns out to be a disk drive, you bind SD to it. It turns out to be a tape drive, you bind ST to it. It turns out to be a CD drive, you bind uh, the other one to it. Uh, <laughs> SC? C, CD. Is it just CD? Anyway. Yeah. Right. So, now this kind of is fairly similar to the DM concept of targets or the MD concept of personalities that um, a, an array to array can be RAID 1 or RAID 5 or RAID 0 or linear or RAID 10. A DM target can be snapshot or stripe or linear or all the rest that this list goes on. And so it's this very similar concept of different targets, of different, different drivers. This is a generic sort of, sort of device for which there are different drivers. So a volume is kind of a generic container device and you can bind different devices to it to get different behaviours. So to get something like a PVOL, a physical volume, you bind a driver which I've just here called block dev, which basically takes an, a block device from outside of the volume infrastructure and takes ownership of it, which stops anybody from mounting a file system on it or something like that, kind of takes ownership and makes it available for other volumes inside the volume group to make use of. Um, loop could take a file and make it available as a volume for other volumes to make use of. Um, so, you know, hopefully we could then implement the current loop driver as, or present the current loop driver in this volume abstraction in SysFS and it would kind of all fit together better. Um, so there, there'd be some, some a volume, block dev and loop, that just take something from outside and make it available internally. And then you have uh, more logical volumes like RAID 1 or Stripe or Cat 8 or RAID 456 or Snapshot that basically take other volumes in the same volume group and do some magic to the blocks in them and present them as a new volume, right? And then these things could be arbitrarily stacked because each logical volume takes other volumes inside the same volume group and that's where the concept of the volume group starts to become important. It's sort of, it's a container that keeps these ones separate from those ones in a sense to make sure you don't tread on your own toes to some extent. Um, and then once you've, you've created a volume, it might be a, just a simple RAID 5 out of a bunch of block devices, or you might want to do, you know, RAID, you might want to do RAID 50, and so you make a RAID, that's, that's RAID 0, a striped set of RAID 5 devices over block devices or something like that. You could combine them without having kind of the infrastructure of lots of block devices in the way. One of the, I mean, you can currently do this by stacking block devices, but block devices internally have kind of a lot of extra weight that just kind of gets in the way. Um, so they're not really designed for it. It's been added as an afterthought, and it doesn't always work the way you want. But anyway, once you've created a volume, and you think, this is a volume I actually want to export outside of the volume group, not just to be used internally inside the volume group, you tell it, again, probably by writing to some magic sys attribute, sysfs attribute, you tell it to, be, to export a block device, and then the block device... Um, MD0, or you probably can give it a name instead of all these meaningless numbers, MD underscore my home, or MD underscore backup, or whatever, um, would appear in the SysFS device directories underneath. So you'd have the volume group, and then the particular volume, and then the block device appears underneath that in the correct order, in the discovery order, as you'd, as you'd want it to. And that means the moment the block device appears, it's already fully configured. All the data is completely available. When um, UDEV sort of sees this block device, 
Now, ask for a petition table that gets a petition table, or maybe there isn't a petition table that gets whatever's there. Sees a XT3 false and super block and decides to mount it or, or not, depending on what the policy is. Um, it just sort of removes that, that ugliness of doing things in the wrong order, which sort of has to be worked around. So that's what a volume would be. Um, and that's, that's really the whole picture. Um, it's, it's stuff that's kind of already there, but it's exposed in SysFS, it's exposed in SysFS with hopefully a fairly meaningful abstraction. Um, it does things in the right order, so that, um, particularly so that the device discovery happens properly. But uh, is it a good idea? Um, and they, these are some of the, the questions. I've, I've actually got code that kind of does some of this, not all of this, haven't written all of the different drivers for all the different targets, but just kind of proof of concept code, and it sort of works. But is the volume group level really necessary? DM, which is the kernel side of LVM, doesn't have a concept of volume groups at all, um, and it still works. Is that good or bad? I think the main thing about volume groups, see, the, the kernel has a concept of ownership for every block device. So when you mount a file system from a block device, that file system owns the block device, and nobody else can own the block device. So you can't sort of turn swap on on a block device that you've already mounted. Um, and when you try and, if you try and fix this, FSCK a block device, it'll try, and, it'll try and take ownership of it first and say, oh, somebody else owns this, you can't just chuck it at the moment, sorry. Or you have to be more careful. Um, so, and a volume group would then, each volume group would own a particular set of block devices and you'd sort of the ownership model would, would work better. Currently in DM, every, DM owns every block device that you give to DM no matter which volume group it's in. So it's, it sort of waters down the ownership model. Maybe that's not a problem, I'm not sure. Um, is it cool to create devices by writing to a class attribute? Well, we've had a suggestion that it's done, been done twice at least, once in um, network bonding as well as in the packet DVD thing, so maybe it is. Is this a question, I mean, is binding a personality to a blank volume really the same thing as binding a driver to a regular bus device? They sort of feel similar, but they're really quite different realms of activity. They're, you bind a driver to a block device because, to a particular device on the bus because you've probed the device, you've looked at it, it's got some magic um, vendor comma device number and so you've done a mapping and, and that's the driver it has to be. It's quite different from saying, I'm, I'm configuring this and I want it to be this way around. It's sort of a different thing, maybe. Um, I missed the question, should I use ConfigFS? This is one thing that, there's this thing called ConfigFS. Does anyone know about ConfigFS? Yeah, good. Explain it to me. Um, this thing called ConfigFS, which is kind of a bit like SysFS, but the documentation says, no, it's different from SysFS. It's because you use it for configuring things. You can have one debugger for And yeah, that's debug FS, come on. You can make directory. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we add MCDA to SysFS and be done with it? I just, I just don't kind of get the distinction of ConfigFS. I've, I've read what people have written and it still doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so either I'm wrong or they're wrong. Or we're both wrong. Um, yeah. So if anyone could suggest, you know, why it would be better to use ConfigFS or something like this, um, I'd, I'd love to have that conversation. And the fourth point there, um, and this is kind of a sticky one. In that, as anyone who's used LVM knows, you can reconfigure a device on the fly. On the fly, you can, um, uh, one really good example is PV move. When you want to use PV move to move a, the data in the physical volume from one place to another, it turns this device, this, whatever was on top of um, the device, it gets turned off. A RAID 1 gets inserted in there and it's turned on. And then there's this RAID 1, so you're writing to both devices, and the data is migrated across from one to the other as a PV move progresses. And once the data's been copied onto both of them, they both have a full copy of the data, which might have been changing the whole time. Then the whole thing's suspended and the RAID 1 is converted back into just a, a plain device and then turned back on again. So data moves around underneath the, the covers and your file system doesn't need to care about that, which is... and I mean, that's just a simple example. There's lots of different ways in which this suspend and reconfigure and resume is really good stuff in DM. Um, how does that fit into this model? 
kind of the most obvious way to me is you'd create another volume with a new description of how it should be and move the block device from one volume to the other. But this concept, idea of moving a block device, it, it's probably impossible to implement. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of the, 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 the stickiest bit of this. And it's kind of, should we, should maybe SysFest should be enhanced so you can move things. But if this is the only situation where moving things could ever possibly make sense, then maybe I need to find another way. Um, I don't suppose anyone's ever heard of people moving. I mean, you, can, you can't even look there in SysFest. You almost certainly can't move things around. Um, so those are my questions. Yeah, Un hot un unplug then replug, yeah, right. which is exactly what I don't want to do because I want the file system to stay mounted in this case. Yeah. Um. Sorry. Oh, you you use that feature of LVM and and PV move and stuff. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't want to take it. Well, I want to sort of make it more accessible. I'd really like to be able to convert a SDA into MD0 and stuff like that. There's kind of issues of where to put the metadata, but they're probably solvable. The difficult thing is, is getting the infrastructure inside the kernel to, to do it seamlessly. And um, so maybe, maybe there's something else to be done here. So a solution to every problem is another layer of indirection? Yeah, another virtual layer to put the block devices. I did sort of, you know, maybe the Instead of putting block devices underneath the array devices, which is where I think they should be, maybe they should be higher up with some sort of linkage to them, with, with, with something, not similar. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Because when you well, when you unplug. Yeah. Possibly. So reconfigure the volume. Yeah. So you, you, know, you, you say you're moving the volume from SDA to SDB. Yeah. You just you know, add SDB and move SDA, and it's gone and it's finished moved over. Yeah. Well, that that that, that works. Um, if if what you're saying is what I think you're saying. Um, if, if, if you, like, if you create a DM target, a DM device that just, have a, just has SDA under it, and you have mount the file system off the DM target, then you can later replace SDA with the mirror of SDA and SDB easily. But people don't tend to put a DM target on top, DM device on top of every block device they use. They tend to sort of look for SDA1, mount SDA1, oh, damn, I really want that to be a RAID 1, what do I do now? Um, and it'd be nice to be able to make that work. Um, and it's it's kind of hard to make it work. Yeah. Right. Right, okay. So the observation is in Solaris, particularly using ZFS, all this intelligence has kind of moved into the file system and the file system creates volumes and the file system, you can tell the file system to, to do stuff with the block device. So in a sense, and it's a bit maybe like the direction they're going with ButterFS is merging the file system logical volume layer and, and doing it all, Doing it under the covers, in, in, in sense, it's kind of hiding it again from SysFS. It's it's saying, creating a, my own separate new abstraction where a file system can have multiple block devices and it can do whatever you like to them. And maybe that's a good thing to do. I'm, I'm, it just kind of, it'll be a long time before the whole world is ButterFS or ZFS. Well, the, the point there is that you just, you make a decision for a user. So, Okay, so maybe it's the idea of the, 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 the configuration tools say, well, no, you're not allowed to mount 
SDA1, you have to mount DM-SDA1, which is the DM wrapper on SDA1. In, in, insist that extra level of indirection is put in there from the start. Um, I've certainly heard that proposed, yeah. I haven't heard it accepted, though. It, it feels... Right. You automatically at the level. Yeah, possibly. Whether. What, in, do a CP inside CISFS? Exactly. Like, like yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, well, it would be nice if, if we could implement move inside CISFS. But it. There is already a. You can already do a rename in CISFS. Yeah. Yeah, moving from one directive to another is kind of... Yeah, you could possibly do something like that. There's another question? Yeah? Ah, oh, it must have been a lie. Okay, yep. Okay. Proc FS. Do I think, sorry, do I think what should be in proc? Like proc yeah, so. And uh, CISFS. For example, that is, do you think there are things that are, should be? Do I think there are things that should be in one and should be in the other? Um, they're both a mess. Yes. Uh, they, they were designed with, with good intentions, but no, there's nobody to um, oversee the progress and say this is right, this is wrong. Um, there's no maintainer of ProcFS. There's no sort of heavy-handed maintainer of SysFS who, who kind of can, has the time to understand all the needs of all the different devices. Because, you know, different devices have really different needs of SysFS. And should file systems appear in SysFS and, and how? And, well, some of them are starting to in different ways. Um, so, I mean, like, like any, I mean, SysFS and ProcFS are both APIs to the user space. And APIs, it really should be a high... Uh, what's the word? You need the high level of requirements to get things into the API, but it's just too easy to add stuff to SysFS, and people have, myself included, that's not really well thought out, not really discussed. Um, APIs are hard. I, I think I think SysFS is going the way of ProcFS. Um, <laughs> has gone the way of ProcFS, but we can't really create another one. That would be even more insane. Sorry? Oh, that's that's our Vero's pet. Have a new file system for everything. I I I've sort of kind of tried that, and that and I used to be the NFSD maintainer. And NFSD has its own file system for exporting its own personal stuff. But where do you mount it? I don't know. Um, in SysFS. <laughs> well, actually, it mounts in ProcFS. Um, but it it does it just. It moves a pro makes it somebody else's problem? It's still a problem? The whole thing with moving stuff as well is you mount stuff on stuff in CISFS, so what distinguishes it from CISFS? Yeah, exactly. Why would I have this one value for file thing? If I mount something in CISCAN on the world, it's different? Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's an API, which is a path name and a file thing at the end of it. And Uh, it's simple. Nothing new goes in ProcFS. All new things go in SysFS. You would like to migrate everything from ProcFS? Probably not worth the effort. You can't because it's API. You can't lose yeah, it from ProcFS. You, you just can simply stop new stuff from it. But because there's no API. Like, there's, there's tools all using the files in ProcFS. You can't lose it. Yeah. There's like PS is the simple one, but that's obvious. But there's some other tools that use. Like I think ACPI started removing some of their stuff. Unless you go and do a full audit of every user space that's been written, you're probably going to hit something that some distro ships that you just can't do. So the brand new 
right here behind Linus. Well, I think Linux doesn't, uh, Linus doesn't care about it. Oh, he does. He cares. Yeah. Uh, he, Linus, I figured this out. He was saying before you're never allowed to break the ABI and then people would break the ABI and they'd be fine. But at the Kernel Summit, actually, he, I finally figured out. The rule is you can't, no one is allowed to complain. That's the rule. If you do something and someone complains, Linus will revert it. If you do something and nobody complains, that's fine. If you want to break, you can break the ABI as much as you like as long as you orchestrate things so nobody complains. So if you control the main user space as well and you get it upgraded itself, like we're actually going to, we plan, NFS kernel developers plan to break a very old part of the ABI for NFS so we can rip out some old code, but that's all right because the user space tool, the only user space tool that uses it, has been using the new ABI for, for years and everyone's really using that. And I'm sure when we remove this deprecated stuff, no one's going to notice. And if nobody notices, nobody will tell Linus, and so it'll be fine. It'll be seriously fine because the problem isn't breaking the ABI, the problem is inconveniencing users, right? And that's, that's really what it's about. We don't want to inconvenience people. We don't want people to think Linux, Linux is bad. So as long as you can fix things without inconveniencing people, it's fine. Which is one of the problems with do I want to do this. Um, I'll still have to keep the old MD inside of block devices around for a period of time. Is it worth the effort? Well, I think it is. I want, I want this is maybe a good point to finish on. I want Linux to be a great operating system for my great-grandchildren to hack on, so I want to get rid of some of the horrible stuff now. And this is a step in the right direction. So I'm finished. Any last-minute questions? Or? Do you think actually that anything of FHE can run with the power rack and stand up Or should the file system hierarchy standard contain any information about ProcFS? Yeah, well, I, I don't. I think the agenda of the FHS is to tell distros how to lay out the file system. And ProcFS is already a standard determined by the kernel. Like a, a distro, I mean, FHS maybe should say ProcFS should be mounted at slash proc, but there's nothing else for it to say. I mean, if maybe there should be a different separate standard that describes everything in slash proc, that'd be fun to write. But I, I think it's a separate a separate concern, because it's, it's, it's different people who can break it. Anything else? Oh, thank you. Thanks, Neil.